So what we're going to talk about here is really one of my favorite things. And um, let's see if I can get this to control. Got to wait. Look. So how, hold it over the slide yeah. and then it will go. Got it. Okay. I'm consultant for Smith and Nephew and Pivot. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is how we learn to recognize, you know, what's, what's going on inside the pelvis and maybe what's musculotinous, what's osseous. And that's our first two layers. And how do we uh, sort these things out? What's fine? What's it? And then uh, finally, what other diagnostic studies can we do to, to, to kind of help sort this out? So in trying to understand what's primary deep gluteal syndrome, is the cytic nerve sort of a tertiary something that's being entrapped or is there secondary structures that are grabbing it? And uh, we want to want to try to sort that out. We know that the, the hip really has a, a long uh, lever arm or very long lever and a short lever arm. And it's, it, it has tremendous force. And these, these strain parameters are, are approximately migrated. Uh, in our cadaveric uh, studies, we've been able to look at, at this. And when we change the angles, we're able to affect the amount of strain that's uh, transmitted approximately through the SI joint up into the lower lumbar spine. Well, there's muscles and tendons in those areas. And sometimes just like the psoas with anterior cam or pincer, it gets tight. Well, the piriformis is sort of that muscle posteriorly. So um, in secondary DGS is, is really that downstream phenomena that happens through premature coupling. So if we have premature coupling where the hip blocks out anteriorly, it can be from flexion. If it's blocked out in terminal hip extension, we have an extension type secondary DGS. And we say deep gluteal syndrome because the nerve can be grabbed by the piriformis uh, or even more proximal, maybe even up into the lumbar spine. So there's a lot of etiologies uh, that can contribute to a secondary degluteal syndrome. Most of them have to do with just terminal limitation of hip extension or hip flexion, or it can be a combined through torsional anomalies. These are downstream troubles. So after we've sorted that out, is it a primary problem from torsion or is do we have a premature coupling problem through cam pincer, uh, ischial femoral impingement? Uh, we can look at and, and we think that maybe it's something primary. We have to make the determination, is it intrapelvis or is it extrapelvis? The second tip here is, is just to consider that. Is the piriformis grabbing it inside the pelvis or did ex, is it external? And is it being uh, manipulated? Is the piriformis being uh, the stimulated hyperactivity uh, through some sort of space occupying lesion, endometriosis, vascular anomalies, space uh, such as a cyst. Uh, and this can also contribute to, uh, to piriformis, uh, increased tonicity. And if you have this 17% penetration, it really depends if it's a muscle or a tendon through the piriformis is how well it's going to respond to physical therapy. It can be a scar uh, in the extrapelvic or in the interpelvic region. The interpelvic uh, more from uh, abdominal surgery and the extrapelvic uh, from trauma. It can occur in the hamstring from hamstring avulsion, uh, both proximally and distally. It can occur from osseous entrapment of the posterior edge of the greater trochan or even the ischial tunnel through dysmorphism or prior fractures. Uh, we can diagnose this through uh, uh, use of ultrasound and deep flexion, abduction, external rotation, just to make sure that nerve is supposed to move and glide as it comes into contact. You can see the posterior edge of a little bit of a dysmorphic greater troke hitting the posterior edge of the, uh, uh, the ischium there. So uh, it can be a varicosity. It can be a varicosity inside the abdomen, or it could be a varicosity at the ischial tunnel. So we have to always make sure that we rule out the lumbar spine. And we do that for, for me with straight leg raise and a slump test. Um, so we'll and then confirm whatever our findings are uh, with a good uh, MRI. But we can have this uh, treated through a decompression uh, at the disc. Uh, we can also look for uh, uh, the sciatic complaints uh, distally or proximally. So every case requires, as Brian just said, a comprehensive physical examination. But what I would say to you is I think it's really important if there's one test to add, and I can encourage you to do one thing, check the hip and extension. Just see what's going on when you lay them down lateral and take them to terminal hip extension. You can't see the kinematics in a prone position at all. It's not possible. So lay them on their lateral side, take them into terminal hip extension, make sure to do a walking a test in the hallway, short stride, long stride, and see what exacerbates the symptoms of abduction, adduction, internal, external. These things can help you to sort things out. And if you do a flexion, uh, adduction, internal rotation test, look at the differences if you accommodate the femoral torsion, like this case. It's negative on the right and external, and it's certainly positive here. This is important for rehab because you have a decreased torsion and you're doing 20 circles twice a day, you wanna make sure you have your torsion understood as to how the patient's supposed to do this at home. Check the up in extension, find out what things allow it to go in extension if it's blocked. 
Is it abduction, ischial femoral impingement? Is it internal rotation, increased torsion? Is it decrease? Is it, uh, uh, you have to externally rotate. And we can do that uh, as we take the hip into extension in those three different types. So old slide, first case of IFI with Ellis Danlos. Can't get an extension here. I like to show it because I think it's very well demonstrates the concept. She's hyperlax, but she can get her hip in extension except when she abducts and gets away from the, and recreates a normal ischial femoral uh, space. Here's, a, here's an increased femoral torsion. Here we are, can't get in terminal hip extension. It's blocked out, minus 10. And then all we got to do is internally rotate. This is a 40 degree of, of anaverted case. And then once we get that posterior wall of the femur off of the back edge of the, of the, uh, of, of the acetabulum, the hip will go into extension. Solution, derotation. So, and, that, and so when we look at this, we can confirm our suspicion from our clinical examination by doing imaging studies that assess all three planes, but it has to be done properly, especially if we need to have the patient walk, then the patient has to be into an MRI scanner. We like to use MRI to, to reduce the radiation. We put the same bimalleolar distance with the normal foot progression, if they externally rotate or they're taping external, if they're internally rotating when they're walking, they're taping internal, and then we make the, the, uh, the MRI based upon that it, it, with the, uh, the knee uh, distances as well. So I think that how we do the MRI is very critical in making sure that we understand this. And then that way we can measure our femoral torsion, the ischial femoral spaces. So the diagnosis of poster, posterior hip pain really is a team effort. And, uh, but we need to keep in, in, in our understandings of both primary and uh, secondary causes of DGS, femoral torsion and terminal hip extension, but every hip exam deserves it to be assessed in terminal hip extension. And that, that contributes also to the core strain anteriorly that Brian just talked about. So thank you very much.